when you're doing a drill in as something as boring as monotonous as fast bowling the first thing you need to do is avoid sensorial adaptation so it's like when you walk into a room full of flowers you smell it immediately after time that smell goes away and that's what happens with fast bowling your senses have just tuned out to it so you need to wake up those senses when you're doing training and that's why variability works and like mm. like the complex as i said and then same but different that was stefan jones and you're listening to the just fly performance podcast <laughs> Before we get to the show today, I wanted to mention a really cool item that is available now from our sponsor, SimplyFaster.com, in their store. That item is Exogen Premium Wearable Resistance. Exogen is a series of tight-fitting sleeves along with uniquely shaped fusiform weights that strap directly onto those sleeves. So what I mean is you can have shin sleeves, arm sleeves, shorts, and a vest And you can strap these uniquely fusiform shaped weights, they're light in nature, 100, 200 grams, that strap on in a way that allows you not only to resist movement very specifically, but also add fine-tuned elements of rotation to that resistance. So this is the next level of wearable resistance. You may have heard this from back long ago on the show, Hank Kreienhoff talking about it, to recently Chris Corfis, sprint coach, talking about it. This is the next level in premium wearable resistance. I've used it myself. I love it. I love not only the way it feels and the way you feel uh, form and technique change. It's like combining technique with power. And so often we just think about weighted vests as just pure force, pure downward gravity loaded resistance. This is the ultimate combination of technique with power. And it shows up in things like Chris Corfis being able to take time off an athlete's 10 meter fly by putting the sleeves just on one side of the body in ipsilateral resistance. We're using the body's own systems, fine-tuning it, and that's what this does. It allows you as the coach or an athlete to create, explore, and fine-tune the way that the resistance is rotationally impacting the body. This is next-level stuff, and I know you'll love it. So you can check that out in the Simply Faster store. Head on over to simplyfaster.com. That's simply with an I, faster.com, and get your exogen gear today. Welcome to another show. It's great to have you all here. So skill development, you can look at that term a lot of different ways. You can look at it from, I think, the boring textbook end of it all, where you're just going through lines of, of theory and, and tractors and fluctuators and all this stuff. Not that that's bad. I think that's good stuff. Or you can look at it from this dynamic and integrated and very alive system where you're blending strength and power and speed and technique and using these these cards of variability and fatigue and elasticity or, or modifying surfaces to create this output that blends specific strength with a skill to take that skill to its highest output. Of course, Stefan Jones is the master of all this stuff. In fact, a lot of what I just said I have got from from him, be it through this podcast we've just done that you're going to be listening to here, be it through the literal small book he's written of articles for Just Fly Sports or the previous podcast. Stefan is an absolute master of motor learning. Stefan was the last dual sport pro. He was a professional rugby and cricketer. He spent many years in those sports, and now he is a fast bowling coach, in addition to being a certified sports performance and strength and conditioning specialist. So it's not, Stefan doesn't just live on an island of only these these principles being applicable to cricket and just so fine-tuned, but Stefan has really come up with a system that universally can get an athlete from that like, okay, I've, I've gotten through some general strength, I'm getting stronger, to, okay, what specific isometrics and in what combination with my sports skill do I need to do? And then uh, what variability do I need to add to this? And, and how does this change over time, et cetera, et cetera? How do we manipulate that to get an athlete to their highest skill level, be it throwing a ball, running, jumping, cutting, whatever your skill is, throwing a discus, throwing a hammer, spiking a volleyball, How do we get that to its highest level by intelligent use of all these training variables? So I'm just really excited to have Stefan back on the show. Stefan has worked with just absolute loads of cricket fast bowlers. He has tons of experience. He's worked with many top players and top organizations throughout the world. And it's just awesome to sit back and listen to this guy and have a conversation with him. 
And it was really cool too, because not only do I learn from Stefan, but he also helps me to rethink about some stuff that I've said throughout the last several years in my own coaching and things that I post. So you better believe I had tons of really cool ideas after talking to Stefan doing the show notes for this is just uh it's a pleasure because i get to like think about how i'm going to utilize this information in my own coaching so let's get on to the show this is a great one uh skill acquisition fatigue variability and, and stefan expanding on the skill stability paradigm for fast bowling that is really applicable to any sports skill all right let's get into it episode 230 with stefan jones so it's always cool to hear what other coaches are doing in terms of, I like asking, what are you doing for training yourself? But I also like that question because it also helps me to understand how you're almost uh, exploring and pioneering methods that your athletes will probably end up doing. So uh, what have you been up to from the training perspective these days? Well, I've been, I like my toys, you know, we've got 1080 sprint, we've got ground contact time, I use a lot of motors. Uh, obviously, I've got the exogen suit as well. So I just want to, and the occlusion cuffs as well. So I just want to, I, I do a lot of reading and I come up with a little bit, uh, an idea, and I need to test it on myself before I then implement it with the fast bowlers or, or any throwers, really. So I've done the increase in the arm mass and the biceps to see if it increases the arm speed. I do a lot, you know, I'm a big Thibodeau fan and he's a great mentor. So I've I've done the isometrics for 20 years and I'm still doing them now and they're back in vogue now and they and the functional isos and the PAP. I do a lot of ex exogeny, exergos. So I just like to do a method, then test it and then go, okay, I'm not doing that. And then so make sure that I... I sieve out what doesn't work, really, so I can make sure that what I'm doing with my fast bowlers I know works. So less time in the gym, maybe more frequency, but less volume, so I know we're getting rid of the fluff. For sure. So if you could take one of the just one of the things that you're utilizing now and you could kind of pin it back, and back when you were a fast bowler and I know you're very strong at one point just from a general yeah. strength perspective, but if you could just take one thing you're using now and put it back into your training back in the day, which one would you pick and why? Oh, definitely my skill stability. My skill stability, it works and it, you know, it's working now with the very elite. There's a couple of, and the thing with cricket, you can't say who you're training because they have a coach who might get upset, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but for me, it's, for me, it's about, well, whatever that helps that bowler it's about them but i i help a few and they haven't braced their front leg so uh, which is one of the main attractors for fast bowling but then you know one of them was four weeks doing my iso holds with the front foot contact position and is now bracing so i would do that because i didn't brace i thought it was about brute force lots of strength so like i I bench press 150, deadlift 200. And like the SSCs would argue, then that is the foundation. But then, yes, that will get you to a certain stage. But after that, what else are you going to give me? You know, there's no point getting me even more stronger because it's not going to work because of ground contact times. So I would go back. I'd love to coach myself now, knowing what I know about the dynamic system theory, skill stability, isometric, because technique underpins everything. You cannot run away from poor technique. So like a hinge, a hinge on a door, you know, you can increase the size of the door as much as you want to, but that hinge will always break if it's the same one, you know, and the hinge is the technique. So it's really important that it's a careful, careful blend. Yeah, for sure. So if the skill stability, if I was to, to make it, you know, if I was a stickler on that question and really said one thing, it would be the ice out of that skill stability paradigm. It would be yeah. the, uh, the isometrics in the yeah. attractors or those key points of your yeah. throw. You would have, that would have been it. Yeah. Gotcha. Cool. Definitely. So it, it is interesting to think too. I, I, I was just watching a really cool Adarian Barr uh, presentation on collisions in sport and he had a lot of throwing uh, examples yeah. in there. Uh, shot put, I think even some like yeah, baseball cricket type stuff. And it's amazing when you think of it from a block leg, a rigid or a uh, block leg that's, that's putting force back into the body perspective. You really are like, 
wait, where's the weight room in that again? As we typically define it, right? Yeah. Like it's really hard to translate a, a regular concentric, eccentric, whatever you want to call it up and down lift to these block brace nah. collisions that are happening in yeah. throwing or swinging or whatever. It's a little bit different animal. Yeah. And what I would do as well, you know, is just begin to appreciate the fascia a bit more. That's crept into my training a lot because uh, it is the biggest organ in the body and, and the fascia does determine the success of a skill that happens as quick as fast bowling does. And and I don't think that is slowly coming out in there, isn't there? It's the anatomy trains and, and, and all that and it's mm-hmm. but it's the future. And back to Adarian, I credit him actually with changing my mindset. I asked him a question about I think it was last year about deceleration on front foot contact. And he said, it's not deceleration. It's about controlling collision and maintaining momentum. And that, to me, shifted my mindset. He lost me after that, if I'm honest. <laughs> but- <laughs> that, that happens to me a lot, too. So no, don't worry about that. <laughs> but I thought uh, straight away then, I went back to the drawing board and I thought, yes, it is. And it's about swing leg retraction it's about pretension and that front leg coming down from above and pulling me forward i'm not stopping myself yes it's actually pulling me forward and i didn't think of it like that and and it's actually changed my mind, mindset and changed my coaching of fast bowlers so i'll be thankful for him for that yeah, that was one of the things that I even um, for me in high jump, because I think between my background as a high jumper and, and coaching high jumpers and you as a fast bowling coach, they share that similarity of a, ver- a fairly rigid leg collision. Yeah. But and I actually was a, I, ironically, uh, I was a high jumper who doubled in javelin. Like my, my best events was like high jump, then triple jump, then javelin, like stuff you didn't have to run as fast for <laughs> at the time. At least I, I think I if I could go back, I think I would have had some tools to be a little faster. But I think that that was what I shared. And that was a mistake I was making all those years it was thinking that and you'll, you'll see it, you'll see the like the high jump biomechanist will take like the high jump bar. I think this was when he was trying to show what like Stefan Holm is like and he throws the high jump bar at the ground or just some like or like a dowel rod. He throws the dowel rod at the ground at a particular angle and that dowel rod like is rigid and then bounces over the bar. But like it's like it's like there's these crumple zones that are happening where the knee does have to bend a little bit. Like it doesn't just yeah. like if you just <laughs> if you just ran up to a bar or to throw something and your leg was completely straight like an iron bar, that would come back into your hip so fast your hip would probably yeah. explode. <laughs> it actually is kind of funny for me to think of now that I've been through all this. Is that, but, yeah, is I, that, that was the other thing as well. So fa- uh, and obviously, I've tested all with the 1080 and stuff. So 20% of ball velocity comes from your runner. So for me, and I, and I think that it's only 20% strength and 80% speed as fast bowling. I think that's Tony Holler's opinion as well, who's another genius. So that changed my mindset as well into sprinting. It's not about gym. It's not about the confines of a wall. It's about sprinting. You know, go out and sprint. Train like a triple jumper. And then I looked on videos of a triple jumper and you notice. So with a triple jumper, that first stride, first, I don't know what it's called, but off the board, that is a, a cross extensor. And then they go into a stumble reflex then because they're coming down from a height and they have to flatten the peak as such because the body is a protective organism for it not to have that much force in it. And that is what so many bowlers do because they think it's a high jump. They try and jump high, which which is indicated by that plant leg, or I call it uh, the impulse stride, which takes you from horizontal to slightly vertical, is in front of the body, which you would want as a high jumper to give you more time to access the stretch shortening cycle to jump up. But for fast bowling, it's not a jump, you know, the more time you spend in the air, the less time you can put more force into the floor. And it's about mass-specific force in minimum uh, contact time. So that's why I go back to Darian and it's sprinting. Just sprinting. And, and, you know, if you imagine your front legs a pole vault, a pole vault uh, wouldn't just, it comes down from above with it and flicks you forward like a catapult. 
it doesn't stick it in the ground and stab you in the chest. Mm-hmm. So that, mm-hmm. that is that deceleration. So it's it's controlling the collision. It's maintaining momentum. Uh, and you you look at the best bowlers in the world. That's what they do. They don't stop. And 1080 sprint, the data shows that, you know, after delivery, the exit stride, you actually accelerate again. And so it's, uh, you know what I'm like with my data, you know, mm-hmm. data doesn't lie. And then you chase the numbers. Then you, you, tr- you manipulate your training to get a certain number higher or lower, whatever you're working on, ground contact time or force. Yeah, I, what I was going to ask you as well as with those collisions, and yeah, those, I like that a- anecdote too of a triple jump versus a fast bowling, where a triple jump you're coming down from higher, and then a fast bowl would be, like you said, you're not not quite as high. And so, well, with the isometrics, how has that thought with um, the collisions and what a dairy and the, the the change of direction idea, rather than just this rigid, like unmoving crash and deceleration? And that, that is a thing I, 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 one of the Darren's principles that I do, um, I'm excited to see it like getting more and more into the, the industry. And even outside of a dairy and I've heard people talk about just changing the paradigm away from just, oh, we're going to train deceleration to let's train, change of direction. This is built in the system. This is the body does this automatically, like as if we're smarter than the body and we need to train it to decelerate as if you were like six and you just forgot to like learn how to decelerate when you were playing yeah. tag or something. I don't know. I find that humorous. So, uh, but what I was going to ask you is with the isometrics and the skill stability. So, if you're yeah. if you're doing like an isometric to really replicate some of these elements, like the block, like has that changed anything at all in terms of like if you have the leg in a similar position where it's going to block and stop the body, and there might be a different crumple zone in there, like the knee might yield a little bit because I think that's interesting. Like I just think like training because it's not like I mean I know in sprinting where again, there's crumple zones, the knee has to bend under the body to allow us to push ourselves horizontally forward or project forward horizontally. Uh, So there's those crumple zones. But I also know that like Alex Santera has improved people's top end speed who didn't have that just baseline stiffness in that mid stance position. And and with the plantar flexion, the foot strength by being, you know, maximally pushing and maximal rigidity. And I hope I'm not like splitting hairs. But I, I mean, it's just interesting to think about, you know, this idea of being maximally rigid versus the crumple zones and isometrics. So I don't know if I, I don't think I clarified my question very well, but I hope you understand what I'm getting at. Yeah, no, it's so what, what I try and tell my bowlers is I go through the attractors with them. And then you've got the, the critical descriptors, the general descriptors and the specific descriptors such as sort of running in quickly, bracing your front leg, stiff of back foot contact, separation of limbs. So all all that stuff that the best do. And then you you pick the attractors out from there. So and then I, I fix them. I fix them to limit the degrees of freedom because there's infinite ways to Bernstein theory, infinite ways to deliver a, a cricket ball, let alone hammer. You fix the position, you create the drill, so you isolate it, you overload it, you constrain it, repeat it. That's the principle. But that will give you, that's motor learning, that's the skill. That has that gives you the base. That in itself is not going to transfer to bowling, fast bowling. Mm. Because when you, when you bowl quickly, you're running in at 7 to 8 metres per second, four times your body weight on back foot, 10 times in your front foot. So there's nothing in the gym you can do that replicates that. However, the skill stability is that bridge between general strength, your trap bar deadlift, your Bulgarian split squats, triphasic, whatever you want to do, is the bridge between that. But then you need to then add variability to it. You need to ask questions of Mm. the system by... I, you know, I'm big on vestibular system at the minute. It's like the supercharge. You know, I got the infinity walks and the VCR isometrics. And so anything that, that questions, that puts it into an environment that the body has to adapt. So, for example, ISO hold would be my first one. So in the front foot contact position, Brace front leg, and I need to clarify. Going back to one year, one year, what you said was there's a difference between blocked and locked front leg. So a, bl- a locked front leg would be, I think, something that's ingrained in them. It's that you, they get slight hyperextension. I, I wouldn't coach that. 
a blocked front leg is there's a softening of mm. the knee, but when they absorb, they don't buckle. So they, they, they're strong eccentrically and isometrically. For me, concentric serves no purpose in sport. It, it, it doesn't, it, it's there maybe to look good, get your biceps done. But in sport, it happens too quickly for concentric contraction. So then they get good at that. They need to be able to hold two times their body weight on that front foot contact position. I know then that they actually, that's a pattern. That's, that's a new motor engram for them because I've had to overload it. Because the old engram, it was a collapsed front leg. But no, I need a new one to supersede it. And, uh, and I go back to your stuff, actually, with where you did the ways to create change. I think it, it, I think it was you, wasn't it? Seven ways, seven ways to create change. And I respect them then by creating feel, overload, mm. uh, fatigue, uh, fatigue-induced learning. And then you make it, you bring some more sort of speed into it. So they walk into it, then they can jog into it, but always maintaining that one cue of hitting their heel on the floor and bracing their front leg. Because I know by doing that, it's biomechanically more efficient and safer because of the, the leverage. And with time, it will go into the, into the system, you know, by respecting frequency of practice. Yeah, and, and it's a process that works, to be honest. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it works, to be honest. But there's no point where people go wrong with drilling is, I don't know, people don't like the term drilling, but say a, a technical drill is because the drill itself is pretty boring, then you need to create variability in it so you can have complex task a simple environment or vice versa. So that's why the aqua bags are great. I'm fixing a base, but then I'm having the aqua bags to create variability. So I, I know when they do that, that box is ticked. I can progress them. Cool. So just to, uh, well, I'll just, I'll just throw one thing in there before I actually ask you about, I want to ask you about the aqua bags and the variability, but I like what you said about there not being like concentric, not really working in the world of sport. And I think, the more you look at the world of sport skill movements as a series of collisions, it's like, well, yeah, where is the concentric here? Cause there's no, yeah. if it's collisions and joints just pass changing direction and passing motion and either the joints are locked up, like maybe the arch of the foot and the, is locking up so that the Achilles can unload and unload properly. And it can be a good lever versus like a, like a calf raise being more of a concentric mechanism. Like a calf raise is concentric, but that isn't going to be a good, isn't going to create a good collision and a good shift into the next one. I think I I don't want to get lost on that, but I I resonate with that. I think that's, (laughs) it's almost like, it's almost like once you get to a certain level of, I guess, maybe you could look at it this way, like for beginner athletes. And I know you do work with a lot of youth is maybe concentric, probably fine up to a certain level, it's probably, you know, maybe it's just more well-rounded at some point if you're really weak. But once you're strong yeah. enough, do you then then that kind of probably goes out the window for the most part outside of maybe general circuits or something. Or what's your what's your yeah. take on that interchange? It, it, it's just it's just general strength, isn't it? it? It's just general preparation work. And that, there's a reason why Bondachuk has a, a lot of those exercises in the general section. And as you go up the tier then towards your competitive exercise, SD, SPE, the, the volume of the variation of the exercises are limited because you only want to do uh, what works. Don't waste your time doing stuff that is just going to make you a better athlete when you pass a certain level. So concentric, you know, your basic lifts, I do them. And those who follow me on Instagram will see I do a lot of trap bar. I do a lot of incline. I do, I do a lot of pull-ups and a lot of rows. I do them, but I work with young athletes who have a, a young training, a low training age, and it's about just some hypertrophy, some tissue tolerance, some structural integrity. That's what it is. I, and I know I've ticked that box then, but when they bowl, you know, you're on back foot contact for 0.10 second and front foot half a second. So... And stretch shortening cycle doesn't have, it can't impact that. 
That's why it's about fascia, it's about the connective tissue, not contractile, and tendon, which is why a hip-dominant fast bowler can bowl effortlessly quicker than a knee-dominant because a knee-dominant muscle-driven bowler needs time to stack up, which you haven't got in, in bowling or anything. But then when you're talking about a pitcher, they would have time to stack up. But I have my theories on, on pitching as well. And, mm-hmm. But I don't wanna, I don't want to say anything about it because they probably I don't know enough about pitching. But I just I just question the amount of rotation and tension around the pelvis. You know, and, and Franz Bosch's big thing, isn't it, is, you know, you need tension for extended force closure, but it's only a limited amount of tension. So and I, I've only just realised that over the years that, you can have one or the other. You can have tension, one, you can have rotation one side, but the other one has to go straight. So when a when a pitcher really turns and loads up, that's is that why they can't brace their front leg? Because they haven't got extended force closure and they can't have swing leg retraction coming down from above. They haven't got time. So it's I, I just look at other sports uh, and I, and going back to your question, is one thing I do know. It's not about concentric strength. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely agree, especially with once you get beyond that initial, like, yeah, just basic levels, and yeah, and anything that actually really truly transfers in with a high speed collision, and and especially with yeah those those slow contact times and fa- but I mean name a sport where there is a contact time that's really much longer than some of these markers for the most part. It's it's always going to be pretty quick. And it's going it to come but, in pretty quick. But pitching, maybe you know, pitchers have sit on that back leg for a while, don't they? And then, and then you've got your batters in cricket, golfers. Okay, you know, I, I have a, I have a theory about a spin bowler as well. A spin bowler in cricket is someone who, who has a slow run up, and then bowl tries to turn the ball. But actually, they might need to be stronger than a fast bowler. But but people go hang on the force in fast bowling is so much more, but actually it's it's not about it's not about time when you're spin bowling. Well, it is about time because you need time to stack up and rotate, and it's and that and that is the issue around the world really in S and C's and and co- in co- coaching. Like cricket is young S and C, so they would look at an NFL or look, look at a baseball. And go well. That's what a fast bowler needs to do. Well, in fact, it's probably so far away from what a fast bowler needs to do. But I think that's changing now with more and more knowledge coming out there. Yeah, I, I like one the what you said too before. I kind of formally ask you about the the water bag uh, and the variability. Is you had mentioned brace not locked, and I think about those. And I I, I just my uh, closer relation is the idea of doing a like an Alex Natera ISO like ISO push, yeah, like a plantar flex in mid stance, and and in that. There is some bend in the the plant leg too, similar to where an athlete would be in that mid stride, and so that definitely is a brace but not locked position. But I, one of the things that I've been thinking about lately, and this was another thing that Adarian uh, actually mentioned on a podcast that's going out here very soon, is the idea of where is the information coming from in the exercise? Is it coming from the hands, the feet, you know, et cetera, et cetera? And I think about doing an isometric. It's almost like you're just you're giving the body a certain information. And then leaving it up to the body and how it's going to use it. Like I'm giving the body information. This is what it's like to have a locked or a rigid ankle yeah. and set arches yeah. in this position. This is what it's like. Now yeah. can you connect these dots? Here's to give you the brain, the body, the the subconscious mind some some ammunition. Yeah. I'm giving you. I'm not you know, but I'm not the I'm not necessarily the maestro. The the athlete is, and and I think yeah. about that a lot. And that how am I? What kind so, of information am I giving them? Yeah. Yeah, so it, what they say is there's sensory input uh, before motor output. So you need to know what you're doing, and that's where that's where the fascia, because of the proprioceptive qualities of the fascia, becomes really important. And that's when it needs tension. By a tensegrity model, we need tension and compression. But when you're just lifting weights, you don't get that, you know. And it's that's why, for me. Skill stability works because you're in a specific position, in a stretch position. So you're stretching the fascia, which as a fast bowler, I need the help I can get. And if mm-hmm. fascia can help me, then I, that's the thing. You don't have to get as strong then in the gym. Spend less time if you learn 
how to move properly. Yeah, it makes me think that's interesting with the and that it was one thing that I've been uh, thinking about recently as well as that the sensory, I would say recently, like it's definitely been on my radar the last like four or five years, like the and especially with the Darian's foot and soles and arch trainer type things and, and just the idea of different sensations on my feet to help me when I'm going to go into a different movement and whatnot. But that's been something I've been really thinking about. But what you had just said made me think a little bit about, I wonder if the extreme isometric holds, like just like body weight iso lunge or iso push up in a stretch position or iso dip in a stretch position, if that is effective too, because it is giving you more information because you're more definitely. stretch loaded. Uh, what do you think about like stretch loading and information in those Oh, definitely. So the, the, the Thibodeau's, the EQIs mm-hmm. and the extremes, because I do a lot of DB hammer and, uh, you know, sports stuff now, but it's, it's difficult because the kids here are so young, but if I have to go with a, a top level elite athlete, then I would get them to hold that front foot contact position, which is a, which is a lunge, but the front leg is uh, blocked and they hold that position. You create the feel to so manipulate the time and actually you stabilize your tractors. That is the isometrics are just the number one for me. And then, uh, and I know you might ask me in a minute because I had a controversial opinion a while ago in that isolation, small isolation exercises. So for me, it's isometrics that should be the number one exercise. And Alex Natera is doing some awesome work and the mm-hmm. skill stability feeds off that really. And it's, you, you know, you can overload the movement. So you fix the position that I want, that I'm going to hit. And I know it's an attractor based on fact, science, data. The ones who brace their front leg are both the quickest. Okay, let's isolate that position, create the feel, add variability, overload it. It's a great motor learning tool as well. And that's why it works to change technique because it's what it does. It's technique and strength combined, which is what specific strength, isn't it? Yeah, I know one of the things I was going to ask you, this is one of the things Alex talked about, I think it was on my podcast and probably in the article he wrote for Just Fly Sports a long time ago, which was a true classic, but uh, about the idea of... He's awesome, by the way. He's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Like that that whole series was just like, that's like the biggest paradigm shift I think our industry has had in a really long time. That was like a jump, like a quantum jump, that that whole series. Sorry, but don't you find, uh, this might be a, a... Typical rant here, but the guys at the very top, you know, your uh, Buddy Morris's, your Alex Natera's, Bosch, Kofist, Dan Fister, yourself, these guys are humble human beings. It's the one below them who have that, that, those are the ones I struggle with, but they're the very top, just humble, always sharing information, glad to talk and respectful. And it's just, I just hope there's going to be a culture shift in the world soon and realize that actually we are in it together. It's not about the coach, it's about the athlete. So whatever information we can get from everyone, it's going to benefit us. And then you choose that Bruce Lee analogy and that you choose what's relevant to you. But you you then respectfully sort of cast aside the stuff that doesn't work. But the guys at the top, I really, really respect. Uh, yeah, I think... Um... I think one of the things too that humbles all of us who have just been around athletes long enough and are open-minded enough is as soon as you just really start to understand what a miracle the the mind, and the, the brain, the body, the spirit of the athlete is and how that system processes information, it's just like, what sometimes like, what am I even doing? You know, in respect to it, it it's just, it is such a, a powerful thing. And so yeah. just to be a facilitator for it is, is it makes going to work every day a lot of fun. That's for sure. And yeah. I was going to ask you <laughs> uh, something about, oh, with Alex's work, uh, the I know he had mentioned like the force plate as, uh, and it's probably harder in a bowling perspective or other, because I'm thinking about, well, if it's mid stance in a sprint stride and it's a vertical push, that is easy to use a force plate to push onto, because he had said that mm. will get like 10% more effort out of athletes because they have a number in this list, like the brain yeah. is motivated and okay, we can really go and then. And then external you know, cues, feedbacks, yeah, yeah, and he's that's what he, the brain wants. He's talked about using that stuff too in conjunction with like plyos, and I've found huge. I one of my favorite ones was using a like a mid pole iso 
with a like a clean on a tendo for time and i just exploded my pr with yeah. that tendo and that weight I mean, it was crazy and then the transfer was a little less to other things because that was more specific to the, the the high pole than it was a bound or something or a sprint start but yeah. it was anyways i digress but i was to say do you have any sort of uh, feedback mechanism like a, like yeah. a force plate or force or how do you how do you yeah, give an definitely so, so the, the first thing i never get a bowler bowling without the speaker so that is my ultimate they, I need to know what their speed is like on that day. And again, Eno Sport, and uh, I follow DB Hammer Eno Sport to a T, so air egg and drop offs. So I know exactly where where I want them to be and what the, and how they are at the minute. So they would come bowl, I'd allow them 3% drop off, and then I'll go again in three days' time, but only allowing them to go that intensity twice a week potentially. Again, depending on pinnacle prime, subprime, but I know these terminologies. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, I'm, I'm down, that rabbit hole get big, the, make it, makes it complicated real quick. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm a big systems guy. You know, I, I think engineers make great coaches, and I've only just learned, you know, over the last. Well, no, that's not fair. I used to learn when I played as well. Okay, so your question, isometric. So I have a four step. So what? So you've got an impulse stride, which is very much like the sprint in position on the toe off. So that can be pushed against, pushed against pins. So I measure that on four steps. Uh, you can also measure the uh, dynamic strength index from that. And I've also come up with the terminology reactive bowling index, which is uh, the flight time and the contact time. So that needs to be a low number as opposed to a reactive strength index, which is a high number. So I just, because what we've seen uh, with bowlers, the bowlers who spend longer on the impulse stride are the ones who try and jump higher and in in turn would land and hold and land heavier on back foot contact, which is highlighted by a longer ground contact time. Um, so that you can do isometrics on that. Then I go on to the back foot contact, which is the same as the toe off, but obviously the legs have switched out. And you just push in vertical now, whereas the impulse was slightly horizontal, which which is why the exergos, the G strength, works so well with that. Uh, and then the front foot contact is just a, a lunge position, but all the weight is... So I put a force deck um, on the back foot and the front foot, and it's a mid-side pull trying to pull as hard as you can or I uh, and I do that sort of not often because that's quite a big of a bit of a fast but I use the exergos g strength twice twice a week to just to measure progress but actually I also use a crane scale as well just to give me a number mm. when you do it the worst thing with isometrics is that there's no number to it they can't uh, quantify it so then that that means that you know, you need intent and they, if you don't give them an end goal, try and beat that number, they'll never be fully stimulated. I will never go max on it. So I always have some sort of number when I'm doing isometrics. Uh, and then when they bowl, speed gun, and then uh, you got the ballistic ball for rotation. So I test everything and it's very much a bonded chuck thing, isn't it? So every, every session you do should also be a testing session. Yeah. So it should be so at the end of the session I know whether I'm progressing or regressing and then you reassess the situation on your programs. So it's yeah, I test everything. Yeah, for sure. I, I know yeah, I was it was just interested with some of those um, you know, diagonal positions, you know, testing uh for maximal force there. I know when I I didn't have force plates, but using just like the, the quasi ISO type thing or loading up a um like a heavy weight on like a deadlift and pulling it up into pins is that was that seemed to work pretty well for me so th that was interesting I, i'd like to talk and steer towards uh, how you add variability because i think you said your paradigm was you you create the sensation then you put variability on it, and then you overload i believe that was the the train yeah okay. yeah definitely so um I, I think it was i think it was yours but i i know florida Florida baseball ranch were also uh, awesome. Uh, Randy Johnson, what's his surname? Randy. I'm not sure. I can't remember his surname. Mm. But so the same ways to create change, stabilize the trackers, manipulate time and tension, create the feel, if I can remember them, 
create a field, feed the mistake, overload the movement, change the goal, and add variability. So the last one is add variability. Uh, and the purpose is to explore the limits where technique begins to break down. So between those attractors, that's where technique falls down, is between where this high octane sports is between each attractor, the technique will fall will fall down. So that's when the drills come in and I add variability then, and I'm sure it was you. So by complex loading, fatigue loading, same but different, or I add chaos. So that's how I add variability into, into my training. So, you know, you've got your complex training. I'm a firm believer in complex training, uh, but keeping that, uh, that transfer window really short so you create the feel, you, you have a pop effect of doing a basic, you do a, you do a second generation complex, the new contrast. You're listening to the Just Fly Performance Podcast, brought to you by Simply Faster. Yeah, that, that second generation, that was, that was a big one for me. I actually got that from the world of swimming, because, uh, man, I'll tell you, like, that works man yeah it does the the world is swimming they've they that's a group of coaches i think that has definitely harnessed a lot of creativity over a long period of time versus i think in other uh track and field strength and conditioning it's more there's more of these like educational hierarchies that i think um yeah and i forget who was the quote of his einstein or somebody but it's like don't let your education get in the way of your your learning i think that was einstein uh, I could be wrong, but anyways, but I just think that that swimming, as I've seen it, is a sport that is almost the epitome of that because it's not it's not like you're not like swim coaches don't go on like on oh, level one to this you know X Y Z with all these like credentials they just they yeah. just learn and experiment and it's always in this pool that's like twenty five yards or fifty yard, fifty meters and they have to come up with all these different ways to c- combine and contrast skills and yeah and to add variability and, that's yes. exactly right and that's a repetitive movement like that would is exactly the same as fast bowling. You know, it, it, you do the same thing. You do, you repeat it, repeat it. And the problem is that builds uh, a really, uh, a, a motor engram that's really tough to, to break down. But also it develops a speed barrier because every time they bowl in training, it's like 80%. Because it's very rare to go max. They, they might perceive they're going max, but actually they're only going at 80%. And games, due to fatigue and pressure and mental fatigue, and as actually I read somewhere today, that um, you only get cognitive. Cognitive fatigue only affects submaximal work. Cognitive fatigue doesn't affect high-intensity work, and that's a recent paper I read today. So more sport is submaximum. That's why a lot of sport uh, athletes, team sports, suffer with mental fatigue. But it's actually, that's why you need to periodize cognitive stress as well. But that's a different webinar and a podcast altogether. Yeah, for sure. But when you're doing uh, a drilling, as something as boring, as monotonous, as fast bowling, the first thing you need to do is avoid sensorial adaptation. So it's like when you walk into a room full of flowers, you smell it immediately. After time, that smell goes away. And that's what happens with fast bowling. Your senses have just tuned out to it. So you need to wake up those senses uh, when you're doing training. And that's why variability works. And like, mm-hmm. like the complex, as I said, and then same but different. So medicine ball work in my base drop and block position so i'm grooving the pattern on the base but i'm actually just throwing medicine ball my one intent with maybe a speed gun is to throw the medicine ball as hard as i can so i fix the base position that's simple simple organism uh, but then i'm throwing a medicine ball and creating chaos up above so that is the same with um wearables you know wearables are, are just Awesome, and they're slowly coming back in. I'm actually doing a, a webinar tomorrow morning for the Indian Sport Authority. So the Lila Extrogen mm-hmm. is, I think, is up there with isometrics for me. If you told me two methods, well, actually, give me four. Four methods that I have to use with my fast bowlers. Isometrics, 
whether that's general, specific, or skill stability. Lila movement, wearables, um, weighted ball bowling, and actually small isolation uh, exercise as well, just for uh, hypertrophy on certain muscles. Uh, and and I, another variable is fatigue, isn't it? So fatigue, and people go, well, you shouldn't do technical work when you're fatigued. But actually, it's another variable that you can use mm-hmm. because, and I've read your book, which is awesome, and anyone who's not bought your uh, speed strength book needs their head <laughs> <laughs> head monitor because that's an awesome book, my friend. It's no, awesome. You. Uh, and you say in that, like, it's you, you fatigued the... Uh, the contractile elements and Franz Bosch says the same. So the connective, connective tissue has to work even harder. Then, so it's uh, we we shouldn't be afraid of fatigue because it is really important. And the whole purpose is to produce uh, anti fragile, isn't it? Anti fragile bowlers. Um, so there's loads of ways you can do it, and then it's designing drills that avoids monotony monotony of repetition is motor learning's worst enemy and with us with a skill like fast bowling you can get bored very quickly and then that the reticle activating system the on button is off whatever you do is not going to work you might as well go away if you're athlete fast bowl is bored just go away or just do another training session Get them to do some bicep curls, anything but technical work, because it's not going to stick. I I really I love that um, analogy used of smelling the flowers and the smell like you, like you can't smell anymore. Because I think that sometimes the best uh, illustrations come in stories. Those are the ones that stick with us, and I I yeah, really definitely. that helps. Um, that really helps because I mean again in a world where I think it's so easy just to think of things in force and muscles turning on and off. It's like, once yeah. you get in the sensory box, it, it, it changes it. And it, and it really, um, I just think that's, that was a really cool one. And so I did want to ask you about, well, I did want to ask you about the variability through um, the water bags, but when you were talking about the fatigue, it, I had a couple interesting things pop up on my own end. And uh, I've been thinking more and more, even about in uh, like a squat, I was watching some of my old, Occasionally, I watch some of my old training videos of me personally back when I was posting on YouTube when I was like 23, all these training videos that I did. And as I've learned more from Adarian, I go back and I watch those videos because I'm curious about what my movement paradigms were like back then when I wasn't really being coached at all. Not that I've ever really truly been coached, but I've had a period of my life where I read more and on, my, on people's predispositions on how to do a lift, a squat, whatever. And I would mm-hmm. watch myself do a squat and I would watch like the first two or three reps. I'm trying to kind of not let my knees come in. I'm trying to keep my knees out a little bit. And then fatigue hits. It's like a set of eight. And then fatigue starts hitting on the second or third. And my knees start taking in a little bit. And I think in in at that point, if I would have known that back then, I would have thought that was bad. But I'm watching myself now. I was like, oh, that's good. Because I'm actually using compression and elasticity to lift this weight. not <laughs> And foot pressure. And all those elements are helping lift the weight, not just me activating a little bit more of that lateral chain to keep my knees out, which isn't even elastic. It's almost like the first two reps, I messed myself up and I had to do the last six under fatigue to get in the pressurization. Yeah. And the, I just thought that was pretty funny. Um, and so, and then one thing I thought about too, this was back way on the podcast so long ago. I'm curious if you do anything with like this in bowling. It's like so simple too. And I think sometimes like just the simplest, I, I like just like the simplest things. It's, it's easier for me to, my mind, I get, I'm, I'm a little ADD and I think trying to, for me, once I get really involved in something, sometimes I, I can lose touch, but I, um, I love Jeremy, um, Jeremy Fisher, uh, jumps coach was talking about, they had a thing called the two minute drill. And it was like, if you're a high jumper, you put the bar at a sudden yeah. maximal height and you jump for two minutes or long jump, yep. you go and and, and I think um, part of the rationale I've heard for something like that is like you you learn to jump better when you're tired. But I almost feel like even more so you get you start to utilize different pathways. You have to stay elastic. If you are not elastic, you're going to get tired way faster. Absolutely. And so, it al- it's also a good energy system contrast, which I'm going to be doing a podcast with Dr. Mark Wetzel about that. It's almost like helps recover you like that high yeah. fatiguing, uh, that fatiguing effort actually recovers the, the lower elements. Um, so for what it's worth, I, th- I thought that I'd no, love, no, I'd so, love that. So I remember saying to you uh, in the podcast a couple of years ago, so I do that in fast bowling and it's pretty, 
it's unique. Nobody else does it in the world, I think. So it's uh, it, I do it in tempo running. So they have to bowl uh, 70%. So you can wear uh, heart rate monitors if you want. It depends what you or 70% of your running speed or, or whatever. So they bowl nonstop for two minutes. Uh, and then I add uh, the Lilo Exogen on to make it make sure that they limit the intensity. Uh, and that is the same, you know, build stiffness, ankle strength, rhythm. We forget rhythm mm-hmm. in sport. Rhythm and relaxation for fast bowling is, I think we've gone back about 50 years. Because if I look at the West Indies bowlers in the 70s, they were all about rhythm. They were all long run up. They were all fascia, they were all tendon, very thin, no bulk majority of them. And and obviously it improve, improves workload perception and the recovery as well. So tempo bowling is a key part of my program. And it's actually, uh, and I tell everyone, you can bowl every day, but you can't bowl intense every day. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm going to do intense today. You're going to bowl 10 balls as fast as you can, assisted on 1080, let yourself go. Get, let's get over that eighty percent barrier. Then tomorrow we're coming back, and you're doing the ten minute, ten, ten minute. I wish two mm-hmm. minute drill. Yeah. Again, I, I, and I go. I think I'm not sure. Again, I might be giving you credit for this, but I think it, it came from one of your posts uh, about that jumper, and then I tr- I transferred it into fast bowling. It works. Uh, it work capacity goes through the roof. The amount of repetition, and I also do it on different. F- different uh, surfaces they oh, cool. wear rugby boots oh, cool. uh, and go outside on uh, on the mud so then you know tendon stiffness oh, is it. then tested even more and then that's periodized because there's a problem over here uh, and i found it now actually with the amount of in- inside bowling we're doing that we have lots of achilles uh, and charlie francis said about it didn't he that that you lose it's tendon tuning so the tendon you desensitize the tendon because it doesn't really have to work that hard because of the hard surface Mm. so that's why i I take them outside i've also got an aero floor so tempo running on various surfaces now that is variability for you that is fatigued induced learning Hmm. no i I love that that's cool that the charlie francis and the the tendon on the hard surface i'd heard kind of some ideas on why grass running is good the tendon has to work more so that kind of like a full circle in my head um i love the the sensory change on like the two minute drill type stuff because i feel like that i always feel like the two minute drill i came to this realization um when i kind of was making a high jump comeback a few years ago and I found the days that I was tired or what just didn't have it, quote unquote, a two minute drill type thing was awesome. Or I would just do it. I go do it even a few times, do like three, two minute. you know, my, your workout isn't okay. You're shot today. You're not going to jump very high or maybe it's sprinting. You're not going to sprint very fast. All right, well, we're going to do so many two minute drills, you know, and, yeah, definitely. and then it's just like, stay elastic, stay elastic, use elastic elements, use technique. You don't may not have the power that you know, your adrenaline or whatever is at a certain level. You don't have that dopamine pop, but you can still, you know, navigate this. Yeah. And I always felt like, yeah, that, that just recovered the energy systems too. You always felt like a couple minutes after that two minute drill is over, you actually was like, man, I feel a little bit better than I did before. I feel more spring. And you wouldn't yeah, have felt that if you just went and just jumped as high as you could, or I guess threw as fast as you could or whatever. It's almost that, that recovers the body. And I was appreciated that element of it too. I need, I, I'm seeing these stories. I forget this like stuff. I forget. And I'm like, Oh, I need to do that again. <laughs> I, like, but occlusion, you know, try the yeah. two minute, try the two minute drill with occlusion cuffs on. Wow. That is, that is an, uh, that is an awesome drill. So, uh, obviously with, because the problem is, um, so firstly, fast bowling is, aerobic lactic so people forget that people chase that burn people chase that lactic acid that lactic burn which i do now and again and i call it the chaos monkey there's no rhyme and reason (laughs) rhyme and reason for it i just throw it in just for mental sort of toughness whatever you call it and it's not enough it's not going to benefit you but it's just going to take you out of that comfort zone and add variability it's going to Stop us building this anti-fragile generation that we have. So, uh, I, so a tempo run would be aerobic, but I also want to activate the you know the fast twitch fibers. The problem with fast bowling is because it doesn't take that long to deliver 
actually the fast twitch fibers because they're the lazy buggers they're the last <laughs> last to get woken up activated they don't actually help in the in the process of fast bowling so why not either pre-fatigue them with a second generation contrast or wear occlusion cuffs and fatigue those aerobic slow twitch fibers so we get earlier into the fast twitch fibers you know what I, I, i'm not sure there's logic to it or science to it but i'm trying to put my stuff into context and i think that has legs excuse the pun <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah yeah uh, so before um, i know our time's coming up here i was going to either ask you one or two questions but i'll just finish with this one is that you mentioned the second gen contrast a little bit and it's been about a year and a half, I want to say, since I made that post, probably. And for me, it was mostly just really two things. One is just making sure that, sure that you put in uh, some sport-specific skill in there rather yeah. than an arbitrary skill. So you could replace a depth jump with a, I don't know, if you're a basketball player, you could do a you know, drive the lane and dunk or something. I don't know, something that's specific. Yeah. And then the second thing was you don't just have to do one wave. You can do multiple waves separated yeah. by some relaxation exercises. And so I just wanted to, I want to make sure I clarified that. So, so and if people heard it, they knew what it was. But how, what might a sample uh, second-gen contrast setup look for you in, in the skills that you're trying to yeah. uh, improve? So. Definitely. So there's there's a few complexes, and again, I, I give Tib credit for this. You know, you got the CAD, you got the Bulgarian, you got the mm-hmm. Russian, you got the uh, the Continuum. Contra- it's so many of them. And then I came across yours, then, which is very similar to his metabolic complex. So I would start with let's go a squat. Okay, I don't squat a lot, but let's say I do that or trap bar deadlift. So I would do a trap bar deadlift. Then I would go. Obviously, another one would be French, French contrast as well. But then I would do an explosive. Uh, so I would do a 1080 bowl, uh, resisted 1080 on five kilograms. And then I would do a free bowl. Uh, but the 1080 bowl would have a weighted ball and an exogen. So it's fully overloaded, mm. whether posterior, anterior, depending whether I'm coaching a hip or knee dominant bowler. Uh, then you have a free bowl, and then you'd finish off with uh, a, like an oscillatory isometric, isometric sort of banded. So anything high rep, anything about rhythm and coordination, like you say about swimming. So trampoline runs, you know, the Eno Sport mm-hmm. trampoline runs. So those are the arm, the press up runs. So anything that's high rep or band, band flies, band press. So it's very similar to Tibbs metabolic complex so it has a uh, yeah metabolic component to it that's how i do it and then you come back the next set you can either go up again but w- one thing i would do and again tib recommended that you never do two sets the same intensity hmm. say if you're doing a bench press you never do the weights two two weights in the row because that really does fry the nervous system so i use that principle with with complexes as well i might go up and then come down I might go up twice and then come down and finish with a faster one because well, that Schmidlbreaker principle of the brain will always remember the last rep you do. So I want it mm. to be fast, explosive, and cl- as close to fast bowling as possible. So credit you, bud. You introduced me to that. Well, thanks. I, I feel like I should... Um... Sometimes I, I would say I forget about some of the things I've, I've put out there, but I sometimes they, over time, they get a little, as time goes on, sometimes some of my posts get a little uh, fuzzy in my head or, or foggy. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, what, and I, and I never exploited it fully, you know, so it's awesome to, uh, it's awesome to come back and see uh, how other people are utilizing it. I mean, I will say yeah. I, I've, I've done, I, I have been on a kick lately where um, me and a training partner did a workout where we were doing like squat cleans and we do a wave up like a, a one set, then a heavier set, then a heavier set, and then run a suicide sprint in the gym as fast as we could with kind of speed being the goal of the work. And it was like, you know, a 25 second change of direction sprint and then super exhausting maximal and then just keep repeating that. And it's almost like the sprint recovered the cleans and but ultimately, it was funny because I was starting to feel the clean show up in my run. I was starting to run differently, not in a bad way, but in an interesting way. <laughs> I just put it that way. Um, but no, because there was um, because there was a uh, I don't know what he was. Was he a high jumper or he was an athlete? And I forget his name. Where he used, it was a famous 
early T Nation days that I tried in early 2000, where you had to power clean and then run a 400 meter run. Oh yeah, Litvinov. Was that was a hammer Litvinov. thrower. Litvinov. But yeah, then there was, was there was questions as to if that actually happened, though. I read somewhere <laughs> like it was okay. an urban legend or something. But I but I, I did, tried it. I, know I did that. too. I tried. <laughs> I tried that too. I actually liked those workouts. I I liked them. Yeah. I feel like the same thing. Like you, it makes you. Those runs are going to be a lot more elastic after those front squats. That's for sure. I was yeah. di- dying on that stuff, man. I'm sure we could. I would love. To, I wish you had more time because I'd love to talk to you about these. Share some yeah, tra- trade war stories of all these, um, these crazy workouts that we've done. So, uh, but hey, Steph, it's awesome uh, chatting with you. I just I love hearing all these things you do because it just breathes such new fire into a lot of these elements for me. Because that's like. Yeah, like I said, sometimes I have this idea and then I just kind of let it, you know, flutter out there and I don't, I lose touch with it a little over time. It's so great to see what you're doing with that. It, it, Pleasure, it encourages me and I, I appreciate it, man. It's great talking to you. Pleasure. Take care, man. Stay safe out there. All right. Thanks for tuning in. Appreciate you guys being here with us. And I hope you had your notebook out for that one. So many ideas and so many things to utilize with training and skill acquisition. If you enjoy the show, you can really help us out by leaving us a rating or review on iTunes, Stitcher, whatever you're listening to. We'd really appreciate that. And as always, wanted to give one last shout out to our longtime sponsor, simplyfaster.com for supporting this show. We really appreciate them and what they're doing. So be sure to check them out. All right. We'll see you guys next week.